Good afternoon, world. Might be morning or might be night where you're watching this, but uh, we're in Roberts County, South Dakota, and this is a new post frame building that's going up for my brother in law. Uh, although you can't see it, on the opposite side of the camera is a, another post frame building that uh, my brother in law and I and my wife built several years ago for him. And, as uh, you know, come true to form is whatever you build, it won't be big enough. And so now he's having another building built. So I'm just gonna walk through some of the, the features and components of you know, what's happening here to give you some perspective. Now you'll notice that I am standing on top of a concrete floor. In most cases, I wouldn't recommend pouring your concrete until at least you have your roof framed up and the roof steel on. Now, why would that be a good idea? Well, first of all, it allows you to pour your concrete floor outside of direct sunlight, or if you uh, have impending rain, like it sure looks like we're gonna have here, you can pour it out of the rain, and you don't end up having to deal with uh, a pour that might potentially go bad. Now, I will typically recommend that you frame your entire roof and you put your roof steel on before you frame your walls. Well, why would I do that? Well, it's because it never fails that you have to walk through things. And when your walls are all framed up, you can't walk through them. So you end up with people having to go halfway around the building to get things that are over there or over here or over there. So th that takes that away. Now the other thing is, is it's much easier to square up your roof when you're not fighting wall framing. Now, granted, you know, this building's not very tall. It's only a 10 foot eave, so that's not that big an issue, but you, know, you start to get to taller buildings and it's more of a challenge and the more things you have to fight, the tougher it is. So, you know, those are just my recommendations for making things easy in that regard. So. One other thing about not pouring your concrete first is that if you drop things like, oh, a framing hammer or a nail gun off of your roof framing while you're putting it together and it hits your concrete floor, it's going to chip your fresh concrete. Now, I'm one of these people, if I have a beautiful new building, I want it to look like a beautiful new building when I move into it. If something's gonna get screwed up, I want to be the one that does it. It's kind of like you know putting that first rock chip in your new car. You want to be the one who does it instead of somebody else doing it for you. So starting around the bottom of the building, you can just see the top of it here, but there's a pressure preservative 2x8 and that's called a splash plank. And it's affixed to all the columns. And eventually we're going to be putting base trim or base angle, rat guard, whatever you want to call it, as a trim around the bottom of the building. And the drip edge of that is going to sit up four inches from the bottom of the splash plank. Well, why would we do it that way? Why not cover the whole splash plank? Well, you'll notice that this concrete apron here around the side and out in front is poured up onto that splash plank by three and a half inches. So if the steel would have been run all the way to the ground, you'd be pouring concrete against the steel. Bad, bad, bad. You don't want to do that. You're going to end up with premature decay at the bottom edge of your steel. It's going to rust and then you won't be a happy camper. So by having that up four inches to the bottom of that drip leg and you pour those aprons so the top is at three and a half inches, you've got a half inch space there that keeps the concrete from being in direct contact with that steel trim. Now, it's essential that the splash planks be properly connected to the columns because of the shear loads in the building. Now, post frame buildings work like unibody cars. It's the steel skin that's doing the work that's keeping it together. Um, this side probably now, it's pretty stiff because of the concrete floor, but if this was a very tall building and just framed up, you could push against it and it'll wiggle. It'll wiggle quite a bit. A 16 foot eave building, you can stand up in the middle of the framed up roof and get it rocking back and forth. And it'll move five, six inches 
on you. So it does make you feel a little bit like a drunken sailor in that case. Um, so anyhow, the wind loads are going to hit your building and the greatest surfaces are going to be your walls and your roof. Now in a building with a concrete floor, the top half of the building is going to transfer its wind load into the roof and then all that roof surface is going to pick up the wind and it has to go out to the ends of the building, down the ends to the, the bottom, to the splash plank, and then into the ground. So it, it's reaching an equilibrium point that way. And regardless of how big that post frame building is, they all work the same way. Loads go into the side walls and the roof, down through the end walls to the ground. So if you have great big openings in your end walls, then you have to look at some extra end wall reinforcement to be able to carry those shear loads. So we have three overhead door openings on this side wall here. Now we specify pressure preservative treated wood on the sides of our door openings. Even though this gets covered with steel trims, the bottom edge of it is closer than one inch to the ground. And so by code, you have to have pressure preservative treated wood if it's going to be in close proximity to the ground. Actually, you have to have a one inch hold up to avoid being treated wood. So we, we've used treated for these verticals. And you can see here, this is set up for what we call dog ears. So you get a, a one foot hold down here. Now, there's some people that they'll leave the dog ears out. Um, I don't know why. You know, I think for some people, they just feel it's too difficult to do an install. Uh, they might think that they're going to run something that's real tall and real wide and hit that. Uh, the reality is if you're putting something that big through this door opening that you think you're going to hit a dog ear, you might want to take a look at what size doors you're planning upon using because chances are you're creating a challenge for yourself that uh, you really don't need to have. So these doors are set up so that on, on one side of the outside doors you have one of these three ply two by eight glue laminated columns and then there's a pressure preservative treated four by six column on the other side of the door opening. Now all of these columns that are embedded in the ground are pressure preservative treated to what's called a UC4B treatment. So if you want to learn something about treating, go down to your local lumber yard or your big box store like a Home Depot and walk through the lumber aisle and take a look at the pressure preservative treated lumber. On the end of each one of those pieces is typically a, a tag that will tell you who the pressure treater was, what year it was treated in, and what the treating specification was. Now UC3, which would be as an example the bottom board around the walls here. Uh, it's uh, just a, a mud sill. It's designed so that when the inside walls are finished that you can have something at the base to drywall to. Those are, are treated to UC3 because they are above ground. They're not in contact with dirt anywhere. Your splash planks, they can be UC4A, which is ground contact, but not buried in the ground. Columns embed in the ground, UC4B. Now UC4A and UC4B tags will both say ground contact on them, and other than that A or B on them, it appears to be identical. And you can't look at the wood and be able to tell by how it, it looks visually to what level it's treated. So you have to look at the tag. Now when you go to your lumber yard or your big box store, you're probably going to find that most of the treated wood that they have in timbers, which would be four by sixes, six by sixes, glue lamb, well glue lambs won't, but timbers are going to be stamped UC4A. You can't by code put those in the ground for structural use. Even though they might tell you you can, don't believe them. The code says must be UC4B minimum. Continuing on with our building, 
You're, you'll see, and we're kind of over on the edge of the picture, but the wall girts on this building are turned flat like shelves. So this is called bookshelf style wall girts. When they changed the building codes and, and went to one unified model code instead of three, they combined everything, confused every building inspector on the planet. Most builders were totally confused by it because nothing looked quite like what they had before. But when they did that, they also added a deflection criteria that didn't exist when there were three separate codes. And that affected your wall girts. So in most instances, if you have a space of over eight feet between columns, you're probably not going to be able to use what would be called an external wall girt, which is what this is. Now there are some exceptions if you have very um, uh, low wind speeds and you have very high graded lumber. I, I know of cases where 12 foot bays will work, but once again, very low wind speed and you're talking about uh, very high graded lumber two by six uh, select structural, or it could be 2100 or 2400 machine stress rated lumber. So the bookshelf style girts do several things. They're very stiff against the wind. And in this case, they've been spaced 24 inches on center, which will allow the client to come back later on and they can put bad insulation in between those wall girts. And it's also set up so that they'll be able to drywall the inside.